Welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast with me, Sean Anderson, the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media. This is the show where I bring to you stories from recruitment owners around the world and recruitment leaders as well, people that maybe don't always own the business, but people that are at the top of the tree of, of some of the most progressive forward-thinking recruitment companies on the planet. Um, and I'd love to hear more about how they how they start their companies, why they start the companies, the things they've been through, the highs, the lows, the realities of, of running businesses in today's economy. Um, and even more recently, we're looking at how the global pandemic is affecting the recruitment landscape and what what some of the best people around are doing to, to, to navigate through it. Um, today, I'm, uh, I'm super excited to be joined by Kyle Winterbottom. Kyle is the managing director and founder of Orbition, which is a, a a relatively new startup recruitment organization in the data, AI, and analytics space. Um, Kyle, someone I've known quite a lot recently, working together on the Hoxo Academy for the last uh, three months, which has been wicked. We're nearly there, nearly finished it. Um, and I wanted to bring Kyle on because I'll, I'll be honest, he's, in my opinion, he's one of the people out there that is standing out in, in the way that he's working. Um, it's just it's just very, very modern, very, very different. So, Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, mate. Got me, got me blushing there. To be no, honest, no, no worries. <laughs> You're looking good as well. Look at that shirt. You got, you got. You look like it's your birthday. <laughs> well, well, funny you should say that. Yeah, it is my birthday. Lucky I've not got like baby slip all over it. The little girl's just been wiping her nose on it and stuff a minute ago. So, uh, get a man-sized bib for your birthday. <laughs> yep. You're looking sharp, mate. You're looking sharp. Well, happy birthday sharp. from me and uh, and the rag listeners. I did see you at eight o'clock this morning as well. I didn't. Know you did. At that point, you looked just as sharp yeah. then. So you. you <laughs> I, do, I look like a Peaky Blinder had a hoodie, which I don't think existed in the <laughs> When I run my academies at 8 o'clock, uh, 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., sometimes you don't you don't see the, the hairdo and all that. It's hard, to, it's hard to get out of bed with that stuff. Um, Kyle, <laughs> I've given you a little intro, mate, but I never, I never feel like I can do it justice. So for the listeners, please just tell us a bit more about who you are and what you did. Yep. So um, as you mentioned now, the I guess the founder and managing director of Orbition. So I guess prior to that, I've got, uh, I think I'm in my 10th year um, in recruitment. So started out like most people, fell into recruitment, classic story, interviewed with the rec to rec um, that I thought I was interviewing for a job for with, with them and, and I wasn't. Um, started out at S3 with Computer Futures in their tech brand, contract biller in the BI space. So I guess, um, you know, ironically always been in that kind of BI data world yep. for, for, for a long time. So um, just, just go back there, 10 years. So you 20, you just said you're 33 today. So, um, he's, he's a year younger than me. He doesn't look it, does he? He looks a lot older than me. I think. <laughs> uh, but, uh, 33. So you were 23 getting into recruitment. Yeah. So what were you doing before? Were you in with uni or <laughs> working? In so, I went to university in the UK, um, got a degree in journalism, um, realized when I came out that to get any kind of experience where I'd get paid for it, um, I couldn't do that effectively. And, you know, I kept getting advice like, why don't you go and um, write for your free no, no, uh, local newspaper? So uh, you probably what, never read the Rochdale. Rochdale Observer. Yeah, you've, you've probably never you've never read the Rochdale Observer, but um, I, 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 I wasn't even keen on Observer. Yeah, so. I, I weren't keen on putting my name to that, mate, and especially not for free. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, I um, I, I was kind of looking at, at what to do, and um, I guess fortunate enough that I've been a, a fairly decent footballer in my time, mm -hmm. and um, I got the chance to go out to the US on a football scholarship, right. um, or so soccer scholarship as they call it. So. Yeah. Um, and I guess decided to choose my subject a little bit more carefully. So um, I, effectively, I, I played for two years in exchange for a, a master's in business, an MBA. Um, so did that, and then right about um, what, in the US, uh, North Carolina. Nice. So nice. yeah, yeah. What was the um, college called? Uh, it was called Lenore Ryan. So it was a small, kind of privately owned um, uni. Um, yeah. But yeah, the the standard of football was was quality like we yeah. had a fairly fairly british team i think there was like a squad of 25 we only had three three americans 12 yeah. british lads um but you know um, we had a lot of ex-academy players so um we had a, a lad that was ex liverpool in england under 18 captain a lad yeah. that played for barcelona in spain so pretty much the whole team had played you know Level. academy academy level nice. i probably shouldn't say that because i think that's actually illegal to have ex-academy players playing yeah. over there so i've probably dropped someone in it there but um 
but yeah, did that. And then I basically came out of there and worked in direct sales for about 18 months. So I know we've had a conversation before about that, but um, one of these type of uh, pyramid schemes, if you want to call it, where you... Yeah, so it was all B2B that I was doing, um, but effectively worked for can, worked on campaigns for two companies, which was Staples, yep. so the office suppliers, um, mm-hmm. and then T-Mobile. Um, so you were in like shopping centres, or were you knocking on doors? Knocking, not well, walking B2B. into businesses. Yeah, right. yeah. So it was it was B2B, um, and I think probably the the accent helped. Um, you know, being in the south of of the US, but I did really well in that. I was ranked as kind of number one sales rep out of about nine hundred reps nationwide. <laughs> Wow. Um, on both kind of campaigns that I did, um, obviously not not consistently, but always in the top top twenty, um, and did really well. And that's why um, I effectively got booted out of the country because they wouldn't give me a visa for uh, an entry level job. Um, so I came back to came back home to Manchester and was looking at sales and you know where I could apply in my, my trade. I guess based on that experience, yeah. That's three. I, it's remarkable, isn't it, how many people have come from that business? It did. I mean, they they were doing they were obviously doing something very very well. At, you know, I don't hear as much about their performance now, but you you, you know, whenever you meet owners in the community, that's like one in three probably S mm. three, which is is crazy. So you joined the the S three brand in Manchester, and you were there for what four four years or so. Well, I was there for um, what was I there for? I was I was in Manchester for about three years, um, and then went out to Dubai. So I went out to Dubai with S3, transferred over there to effectively kind of establish a contract business for them because mm-hmm. um, they'd not had that in the in the Middle East at the time. Um, so yeah, did, did that. How did that go? Went really well, actually. So um, it was, it, it's funny because I think in the, you know, the UK contract market was saturated um, as you'd expect. And obviously I'd, I'd flipped from doing tech to oil and gas. So um, I think I was there six weeks before the oil and gas um, market crashed. So we had wow. to kind of pivot and look at other other sectors that the business had not done before. So kind of, you know, construction and more mainline and more mainstream engineering and stuff like that. But it was it was quite, quite strange because I think, you know, the UK contract market is very well established and, and out there it wasn't. So, you know, we were having to almost educate clients, you know, so like we, you know, our pitch was effectively we could take everything off their hands so you know why bring someone in on a permanent basis when you only need them for six months um you know and you've got the visa and all that mm-hmm. type of stuff so we just kind of we packaged a solution together effectively that was you know we'd take care of the visa the payroll the insurance any tax stuff that was going on obviously country to country and um and that type of stuff yeah and that, that kind of team scaled really quickly did did really well in a in a pretty short amount of time and we were placing all over all over the middle east so you know even in iraq and things like that um oh. i was actually due to go on a plane <laughs> to um to kurdistan when that when all that trouble was happening and my flight got cancelled because the the city got blew up the day before wow. so um, that was that was lucky yeah i guess yeah well i imagine all that work you did as well was built on that foundation of of say of proper hardcore sales. If you think about what you did in the US, then when you come back, you know Manchester S three, I'm sure it was pretty aggressive, um, you know, outbound focused. You then take that to Dubai, it works. Um, you then moved around a bit, didn't you? So I've looked at your background before. We made a little chat, but yeah, was it always as a recruiter? Was it always a similar model? Were you always out there, you know, basically deciding on your market and go just going out? Connect with people, pick up the phone. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So, I mean, I, I left S3, um, got approached by a business, pretty unique proposition to go in and kind of head up the entire thing for them from a from a you know Middle East standpoint. So, um, it was it was probably you know too big of an opportunity for me to turn down really, and I I, I learned a lot about myself during that experience, and I think. Um, you know, we did quite well in a short amount of time, but we were owned by a bigger Australian business who got a new CEO, and they ended up selling that part of the business off to uh, to another to another company. So they effectively made the whole office redundant after about a year. Um, so I was looking. I mean, the, the thing with the, the market in Dubai, I'm not too sure how much work you do out there, but it's um, it's fairly small, right? And it's very insular, and the the, the roles that you know a senior level are pretty few and far between really so um i was looking at what was going on and obviously that 
you know, 20, when was that? 2015, 2016. That's when the, the U S kind of boom really started to kick off. And, you know, a lot of businesses had just gone out there and they were looking to bring in us, uh, UK recruiters to, to the U S. So I kind of got dragged into that. Um, and you took a job in New York. World. I took a job in New York. Yeah. You don't yeah. find like, because one of the things about recruitment, I think, like the beauties of it is when you stay in one market and you get well known and you become like, you know, it gets easier, doesn't it? Like every year you're in it, it gets easier. Whereas you'd kind of establish yourself and then you kept moving around and you kept yeah. doing like, yeah. was that. Was that tiring? Was that draining or was it exciting? Like, how did you feel about all that? Um, I think it's two for mate. Like, I think if you if you ask me now, like I've always been a very firm believer that if you're a good recruiter, you could be put anywhere in the world into any market, and you'd find a way to make money. I and I still I still believe that to a certain extent. But I think what I have learned over the last two or three years, especially, is that if you've got a if you've got a passion for the market that you're doing, then that certainly helps and goes a long way, and it helps you to establish yourself quicker and, and almost makes it you know difficult to walk away from i guess but um i think the thing with me is i i like the i like the challenge of i've, I've done a load of things where i've started something from scratch you know so mm -hmm. s3 then i moved to an, that other business in dubai where i you know was literally out getting the the office you know having to go and yeah. it's, a, it's a complete start again um same and then when i went to lawrence harvey that was starting out a brand from scratch in a new location so i've done that there's obviously something about that that appeals to me about yeah, you know yeah. taking something from inception to putting it on the map um so i quite like that but you know i've got to say yeah i mean it, of course it's it's it is taxing and it's, it's it can be draining because you know you get it to a point where and this happened time and time again with me really but you get it to a point where it's just starting you know you're just starting to, to see the the fruit and, and the rewards and, and then you'd kind of pick up and and go off again so um yeah, it was, yeah. Well, you know i totally agree that, i totally agree that a good recruiter can go to any market and make money i totally agree with that but i also think you know it's inefficient it's tiring it's probably not the most fun um it's not the easiest way to make a lot of money is it like the best way yeah. in my opinion is to sit in one market and get well known and mm -hmm. and become amazing at it that, that's how i think about yeah. anything right you know yeah. um but without that with that you know, you might not get the variety. Some people just love the moving around. I think I think if you're in a manager role, like look at Guardiola. That's what I when I was a manager for a bit, I was like, if I don't start my own business, I'm gonna be like Guardiola. I'm gonna go do three years at a company and then I'm gonna fuck off to like Spain or I'm gonna go to, you know, Brazil, America, whatever, and just keep learning from different environments in a manager role where it's not about necessarily my billings, it's more about the people I bring through. I think yeah. that's more transferable, but um and when you're a biller and you or you ground up biller, bloody hell, it's, that, it's, it's, it's consistently hard. Um, yeah. So when yeah. You, you talked about, we had a quick chat offline. You mentioned so the, the the role you had before this, before you started your business, was Lawrence Harvey, right? And that that sounds like it it was a pivotal pivotal role for you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely was. Um, I think that's where I'd I'd probably seen a lot of the. The, the success for, from coming from some of the you know the marketing stuff that that we're probably going to talk about really um so so i think it, it's there that i probably realized actually there's, there's maybe a better way to work because obviously you know i think I, I was really lucky when i started at s3 like we had a we had a an absolutely amazing team like a, a really really strong team of people that you know i was lucky to kind of learn from um i, I guess and you know but but that their, their model is completely different. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that recruitment's changed a lot, I think, you know, even just to, to back then. But I'd always been in environments where, you know, after I left S3, yeah. I'd moved into, you know, I was still the kind of face of the business and still going out doing a lot of the BD because I like that side of it. But I was more managing businesses and teams, you know, managed like teams up to kind of 18, 20, 20 people. So, and then, you know, people were kind of questioning again, as you just said, like why move around? Um, and I went back to Lawrence Harvey and started again, like into a, a, a new market for the business as far as the UK went. Was it your so, area that you knew though, the data BI stuff? Yeah. So, you know, I'd, I'd always been, I, I guess when I, any, when I was back in the UK, that's where I, that's the kind of where I had relationships. So it was the easiest place for me to, to kind of start, I, I guess, but obviously that space had, had, been on its own journey since I'd kind of yeah. left it last and it, you know, it had kind of blown up really. So, um, but yeah, you know, I went to Lawrence Harvey and started 
um, a, a brand from scratch, new market in a new location, and it was just me. And and I was going to get back on the tools and start billing. Um, and I'll be honest, I was kind of like, <laughs> I don't know if I'm cut out for this anymore or not. Like, it's, um, you know, I, I was I was questioning myself to be honest with you. But, but yeah, that 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 was the the pivotal moment I think in terms of you know my my thought process around how how the recruitment industry is going to work kind of moving moving forward i'd say right so tell us a bit more about that so you've gone from i, I remember that like, the time you're talking about it's probably i don't know it's around the time i started hoxo i think so you're talking a couple three years ago or circa three years ago um was it something that you learned off your own back like how did you start to see that things were the opportunity was changing um obviously i think the whole thing with linkedin in in that time frame you know from 2011 12 to then 2018 had come a long way and um you know it was everyone was on it now whereas before it was kind of like it was a kind of thing that you were kind of on you know yeah. a, a bit like me now with like twitter i used to be on it and i've, I've not been on it for about six years so yeah. um and i think that you know that had been on its kind of on its own journey um to be honest with you, when I kind of went into that business, I was looking at, you know, right market. So we're going to do data analytics. <clears throat> and I was just thinking, if I'm being really candid, I didn't know whether I had the engine to go back and do what I'd done, you know, time and time again, in terms of, I'm going to have to start picking up the phone to people who don't know me because I've been out of the country for so long and out of the market for so long. Um, you know, calling through switchboards, all that type of stuff. And I was just thinking there's, there's got to be, a better way i wasn't too sure what that was and i think um very blessed at lawrence harvey and the wider lhi group that they've got a a wicked marketing team in my yeah. opinion you know I've, I've been around a few businesses and and they were they were by far kind of head and shoulders above the rest in terms of how they thought about mm -hmm. you know th they were constantly trying to tie the marketing piece to the sales piece which i think a lot of businesses still look at them as very separate you mm -hmm. know marketing's branding um yeah. i, I kind of get a lot of and they, they don't often tie the the two together so you know when i was sat with the head of marketing the conversation was well you know have you thought about doing events or you know is that something that you might be interested in and if i'm being honest i, I kind of brushed it off i was like yeah you know maybe it might be something that we do and, and so on and so forth and but then i think i just got to the point where i was like well let's just try it. And if I'm being really honest, I, I probably never envisaged that I was going to go on to do an event. It was more of a bit of a trial to see actually, is this going to get me on the phone with people easier? Yeah. Um, and that, that, that was the initial concept of, you know, if I can go to, to people and approach people rather than the traditional, you know, recruitment pitch, you just another recruiter that's calling a, a hiring manager um, with with the same spiel effectively can I, can I somehow get them on the phone? Cause I think that that was always the thing with me. I knew if I got people on the phone that I, I was good enough at the job to, to get results from it. But obviously, you, you know, I think the, the times had, had changed, you know, you, you load up, you know, back in the day <clears throat> at S3, you know, it's like your typical day was right. You're doing client calls in the morning and you load a list up of 60, 70, 80 clients. So you just smash through them and, and hopefully you might get 10 that they'll, they'll pick up the phone. And, and that was, yeah. that was always the process. It was like, you know, you had to do, 10 client calls before you moved on to candidate calls in the afternoon and if you didn't get 10 in the morning and that rolled over into the afternoon then you were staying late to do your 10 yeah. candidate calls before you went home so and that and that was the way it was um but i kind of just felt that you know i mean i looked internally at, at kind of myself really because i don't know about you but like if any if anyone calls my personal mobile on a number that i don't know even if it's a mobile number i don't answer it because yeah. i think no no if it's important, they'll leave a message and I can call them back. And I think I started to notice that. And I was kind of thinking, well, you know, rewind 10 years, a recruitment business's USP was how good their database was. And back then when I started with S3, the database was wicked. You know, they'd been around forever in comparison to a lot of the other businesses. They had loads of candidates. It was, you know, mobile numbers were on there. So naturally you got older people that a lot of other people weren't probably. Um, but in this day and age now, even if you've got the mobile number, it's not necessarily an advantage too much because no one fucking answers it. So, <laughs> you know, so I was kind of like, well, I need to, there's almost needs to be something to entice them to speak to me. Um, because if, you know, if I'm just going to them with recruitment, if I'm just specking in CVs, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to 
become part of that crowd, you know, of recruiters that sends them mail shots, that sends them CVs, that, you know, Trish tries to call them 15 times a week um, and all that type of stuff. So that, I think that was the, the pivotal role. And obviously then, you know, going into that, actually then starting to see the results of there was interest there. And to be honest with you, when I first started it, I had no clue what that event needed to look like. So I, I kind of approached it as a, you know, I'm a specialist in this space and I want to put an event on that's going to add value to, to, to the community. You know, would you mind giving me a bit of help and advice on, on what that would look like? And, you yeah. know, naturally, if you start asking people to, to help you and, you know, it was never recruitment related ever. Um, and then you get them on the phone. And I remember, I think the first conversation I ever had, I was on the phone with a guy for about 40 minutes. He became one of my best clients. I'm on text with him all the time now. And at the end of the call, they were kind of saying to me, well, you know, we're going to need two data scientists in the next, you know, two or three months. Is that something you can think you can help me with? And I was like, can two right? Is what do you think I'm yeah. calling you? <laughs> yeah, but you know it, what I mean? It is. I mean, I, God, I can relate so much to what you just said. I, I remember a similar, you know, 2016 was the year for me when I really – really thought LinkedIn was changing. My role was changing. I was that manager role. I had a bit more time. I think I had more time to think because um, I had a team that I was managing. I wasn't really billing. And I was just like trying to get them to do things I didn't like. Like I didn't genuinely like the 10 calls before 10 a.m. shit. I didn't like it. Like mm. I believed, I know it works. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say it doesn't work because it does work. And I think it'll always work. I just fucking, yeah. just a shit way of working in my opinion. It's horrible. So I was like, it's got to be a better way to to not burn out and enjoy this. Um, and like you just said, I had no idea how to plan an event. I, mean, I had no idea to create a fucking business in marketing, but you can do it. Like if you if you believe in something enough and you, you've got the ambition to figure it out, you can do it, right? So um, I love that. So you 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 you're opening up with some <laughs> you don't even really have. So you're selling it before you're building it, which is again a massive fact, thing I've learned that you you know once you've got an idea, you can. If you can communicate to people, you can get it in front of them before you you can test it before it and work out whether you're gonna do it. Because if something mm -hmm. if no one's in, if no one's interested in five calls for an event, then you move on, right? Um I but think, then you I think that's where thing. yeah, I think I think a lot of to be honest, I think there's a lot of pressure now on recruiters to be doing this stuff. Um and I can kind of see why. And I think a lot of recruitment and recruitment uh, recruiters and recruitment business owners and recruitment companies that they often don't know where to, to start. And I get asked this question a lot, but my, and that's my always my advice is go and, just go and ask the people that are going to come to this event. Like yeah, well, there's no want. point in, and, and, and I still say this to this day, like even like obviously now with the podcasts and stuff, as anytime I approach anyone, the first question I get back is what's the topic? And I'm kind of like, well, you tell me. No one listens to these podcasts to listen to me talk, yeah. <laughs> you know? So yeah. I, sculpt, I sculpt the topic around what you're interested and passionate about, what you're confident in speaking about, and, you know, maybe something that's trending that, that you've got experience with. Um, and I think, you know, all too often we're kind of trying to think of this genius idea and go and sell it, whereas you can get the idea from someone else. And that's exactly what I did, you know, and it just so ha happened. You know, I'm probably, probably lucky in hindsight because there's been – you know, number of other um, events that have popped up that have been pretty much the same thing, you know, a, a data leadership event. And, and I kind of stumbled upon that by just asking the question, you know, if there was an event to be put on that's that's not out there, what would that be? And all of these people, you know, hiring managers, heads of or directors of data, data science analytics, whatever the case may be, were saying, you know, there's loads of technology related events out here in Manchester and Leeds and Edinburgh and stuff like that in the north because that's where where my remit was. Um, but there's nothing for leadership figures, you know. So if you if if you're thinking about putting something on, that's probably the best route to go down because we've got to travel to London. It's a day out of the office. It's a you know it's a train ticket. It's maybe even a hotel. And then that became the little kind of nugget for me, you know, to go right. That's that's the, that's obviously the USP. Like we're going to put something on that's just specific to the north. Yeah. Um, and went, you know, took that information from that call to the next call and that, you know, and that kind of idea evolved as the calls went on, I guess. So love that. So you did that whilst working in another business whilst, you know, and what sort of results did you see from having that fresh approach and talking about everything but recruitment? I mean, I reckon, and I, and I don't know the exact numbers, but 
I'd say 98% of our placements came from <clears throat> talking about that event. I'm interrupting this podcast to give you an update from our sponsor, Audro. The team at Audro have launched another feature in summer 2020, and it's going to be a game changer. This is going to massively change the way the recruitment agency market operates globally for the future. They've called it Audro Producer. This platform sits alongside the company's award-winning video interview opportunity um, and gives you, the recruiter, the ability to create engaging, eye-catching video content ready to share in a matter of minutes. So you can record or upload a video, um, and then you can add banners, overlays, images, subtitles, logos, so that you can create these eye-catching videos that are built for LinkedIn. So whether you're interviewing, whether you're doing sales messaging, or you're just trying to put out valuable content on, online, then Odro is no longer just a video interview platform. It's also a content creation platform for recruiters. Get in touch with Odro today to see how you can implement this into your recruitment agency ASAP. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to the show. I'd say 98% of our placements came from <clears throat> talking about that event. Because that... I just I realized that that worked like in terms of just getting someone on the phone and, and obviously you can talk about you know we were able to talk about the event which gave us a bit of credibility in the market obviously not at first because we'd never done it so it was kind of hard to re refer to but we're just using you know some of the information that we've taken from the last call into the next call and so on and so on and so forth but it gave us credibility but it also gave us an opportunity to show that we know what we're speaking about. I think this is the thing for, for me with a lot of kind of recruiters out there is there's this perception of recruitment, right? And and sometimes fair, sometimes unfair. Um, but I think if, you, if you're able to show that you know what you're talking about, it became so easy then to kind of spin it into, into a BD call. It kind of just yeah. happened. It was, and, and this, it was funny because when I was, when we started hiring and scaling that team, and I kind of was teaching them the same process. They were kind of a lot of people that I was managing and trying to teach and coach were kind of, they were really kind of apprehensive about it. They were kind of like, well, okay, I, I get that. I'm going to speak to them here about this event and then what we do, but how do I flip it then into a BD call? And I was just like, you're thinking about it too much. Just ask, just ask the question. <laughs> like you've just spent 20 minutes talking to them about, you know, if there's something, you know, if you're going to put this event on what the topics could be, and those topics come from their challenges and frustrations, you know, so just you've already built enough rapport. They know you're credible. Just ask the question. Um, and I think uh, nine times out of 10, often they'd bring it up first. You know, they, yeah. they kind of say, and from a recruitment standpoint, we're, you know, two or three months time, we're going to have to be looking at this. You know, we'd need to get you on the PSL, but we want a specialist in this area and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, easily 98% of the, the stuff, the, the, the placements we did came off that event. I think there was a couple of placements that might have been, you know, from a previous relationship where I'd known someone or, or something like that. But it was all, did, it was anyone, all business. <clears throat> did anyone from above, like, you know, mandate that you did that or was that all off your own back? No, no. I mean, I mean, obviously, I had a lot of support from marketing in terms of getting that all put together. And um, I guess the position I'm in now, you realize how much support you actually get when you work for somebody else, right? So um, I still do those events now. They've been kind of, you know, rebranded and rebadged as, as something else, I guess, for, for conflict purposes, um, as far as brand goes. But yeah, you know, I, I was the face of it. I went out and got the people and then the event just happened, you know, all the marketing, the invites, all that was done for me. And, you know, now I'm sat here on, on my own and, <laughs> and I'm kind of like, shit, there's, there's a lot to this. Um, but no, there was no mandate. I think there's, there's an awful lot of push internally to be trying to do more stuff a bit differently. And I kind of, you know, I was often used as a bit of a case study of, well, you know, look what Kyle's doing in Manchester around this. Could, can we kind of do something similar? Yeah. Um, but I think... I think often people think of it as two separate things. Yeah, they do. They do. Where, you, know, you know, it's kind of like you've got your business and you make placements because you're a recruiter. And then if you've got time, you do these events and this other stuff. And, and they're kind of almost like the nice to have. Whereas I kind of realized pretty quickly that if you lead with that, the placements follow. Yeah. You know, it was just, you could, there was a way to kind of package them together. So it, it kind of, you, you could do it all at once. Love it. Love it. So when nicely, you know, timing wise, very nicely, when did you, uh, when did you start to think or realize you were going to start your own business? 
to be honest with you, I've probably always had it in the back of my mind. Um, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, I've, all, I've you know, I'm just, I'm, a, I'm an ambitious person, so I th- I've always thought that that's probably where I'd, I'd end up. Um, I think the there was a couple of kind of key moments. I think in in the journey, um, and one of them was, you know, lockdown happened. The UK market pretty much came to a standstill. Um, I'd we'd already started trading a little bit from Manchester. So we started to build out a separate team that was looking at the Nordics. So I was still at Lawrence Harvey at this time. And, um, but it was mainly in Sweden. So I kind of pivoted all of the the team to go to the Nordics because, you know, they just, they seem to have stuck the finger up at COVID and we're just cracking (laughs) on as normal. So I was like, well, no, that's where the money's got to be. So let's just park what we've got for now and, and look over there. And, um, so I was like, right, well, I'll take Finland. We didn't know much about it, but we knew it was a pretty big, pretty big scene in the AI space. And I think it was at that point when I was, you know, sat adding managers and hundreds of them to the system again for like the fifth time in my career, starting yeah, something from scratch yeah, again. Yeah. And I was kind of like, I shouldn't be doing this for somebody else. Not like, not again. Like, <laughs> here we go again, type of thing. And I think uh, so. That kind of started the ball rolling. Um, so there was no, so you didn't you didn't start 2020 thinking that was going to be the case then, or def, you weren't like definitely starting a business this year. I, I had absolutely no plans um, <laughs> to, to leave to leave Lawrence Harvey. Wow! Um, and, and you I, mentioned you had a you mentioned you got your, your your wife got pregnant when you went to New York off like off air. So how many kids you got now? Two, Just one, two. So you're 33, 32 at the time. Two kids, married in a in a stable job, going into a global fucking pandemic <laughs> and, you're, and you're sat there looking at hiring manager names going, no, 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 I'm not doing this again. So tell us, let's, let's, tell us how that evolved. Well, so I think, I think that started the, that started the ball rolling in my mind. To be honest, mm-hmm. I, I didn't really act upon that. That was just, you know, as you do yeah. sometimes you sat at home, you're kind of getting sick to the back teeth of everything that's going on. You're in lockdown. You're not allowed to go out. You've got two kids running around under your feet. Um, so I think that that was definitely the starting point where I was kind of thinking, should I, should I be starting something again from scratch? And then I think a few things happened internally with the business, as far as my progression, um, kind of came, came to fruition. Um, and obviously part Lawrence Harvey, a part of a bigger group, they offered me a bigger role, but to move, (laughs) to move away from, from what I'd been doing. So to move into one of their sister brands in the construction space to basically look after the US for them, um, which obviously I was kind of like, well, you know, US fees, yeah, tick, you know, that, that, that'd that be nice, you know, the opportunity to scale, it's kind of a bit of a global role, so it's a step up, it's more money, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but I was thinking about, but do I want to, but to your point earlier, do I want to again for you know whatever this would be the, the fifth sixth time to go and then start and go into a mark a new market a new territory start something again from scratch when we were about you know we were two and a bit years into that journey with Lawrence Harvey in Manchester where we'd we'd pretty much established ourselves as one of the biggest players in that space you know we were putting on the events by this time we'd already I'd already started the podcast and I was just kind of thinking it's just be it's going to be a bit weird really if I just all of a sudden like up sticks and yeah. and and kind of you know disappear and go start doing construction in in, in the US and um, as I said I'd I'd never had any plans to leave the business to be honest I kind of didn't want to leave the business but there was that burning desire for me to kind of I guess do my own thing coupled with the fact that you know what had gone on internally plus the pivoting and starting even with LH doing a, a bit of a bit of something new um, and and I guess that they wanted an answer of what I was going to do. And um, I was kind of looking at it. And to be honest, I was probably, I was, I was thinking about taking it and then I went away, um, lockdown lifted and I ended up going to somewhere in, in Wales with, with the wife and kids just to get away for a few days. And I was speaking to the wife about it. And I don't know, I came to the realization that I was probably doing the wrong thing. Um, so I just, you know, I had a really good relationship with my, with my old boss um, and I just kind of texted him and said, look, this is going to be a non-starter. Um, and, and that was it. So, you know, it was kind of like I didn't want to let him down and I didn't want to commit to doing yeah. something that I didn't want to follow through with. Um, 
even at that point, I was kind of, st- I still wasn't hundred percent sure. I was kind of thinking, oh, am I going to have to go and try and find another job? And then I was just like, you know what? Like now's, now's probably the best, best time. If I'm going to do it, let me just figure out a way that I can go. Worst, and worst than better time. I mean, so many people have talked about this, whether or not, you know, the, the lockdown will drive the, the launch of new agencies. I, I don't think I've heard about as many as I probably expected. But I think they're coming in in 2021. I think there'll be a wave of new agencies that are coming off the back of the way that this year has, has unfolded. Um, what I'd I'd like to, I mean, from my perspective of what I've heard, it sounds like Lawrence Harvey actually was a, an amazing role for you. It sounds like they treated you well. It sounds like they it sounds like they gave you a an opportunity to do things differently, to learn a you know to learn a way of working that you hadn't done before in all these other roles, mm-hmm. which have in turn turned you into what I think is one of the most exciting brands that there, there is in our space now. So, so when you, when you left, what happened? Like, did you already know you, you, what you were going to do? Did you have the name and all that? Or did that all unfold after you? Left? <laughs> no, that, I mean, that, that was the, I think this kind of fun, funny story in there. So I was like, literally, you know, I, I'd effectively, by telling my boss, I wasn't going to do it. I'd, I'd basically given him my notice. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of the things you work for a bigger business and, and Lawrence Harvey and the LHI group, they're, they're a you know, mid-sized firm, 200 and odd people. Um, and, you know, the growth for me to do what I was wanting to do as far as the Manchester office was concerned and its own P&L, um, you know, it, it was kind of one of them where I could either grow by adding more markets, which effectively would go against everything that I stood for and vocalized and a lot, you know, yeah. around, you know, you just start to add more, more markets to it and you start to dilute the offering and, um, or to get a bigger geographical remit, which ultimately wasn't possible because we had, you know, got offices all over the place. So headquarter, the office um, was headquartered in, in London, you know, office in Bristol, two offices in mainland Europe. So it was difficult for me then to try and take a stake a claim on, other ge- wow. you know, geogra- uh, geographies. Um, so w- that's where the whole proposition came for to, to move into a different brand effectively to be able to give me a bigger role. Um, but I guess at that point, you know, I told him that I didn't fancy doing that. And that was, you know, effectively the icing on the cake in terms of, well, there's probably, that's probably the end of the road, so to speak. So I was kind of like, right, well, <laughs> I've basically got a month's gardening leave. To, to figure my shit out you know because um and, and the missus was like are you kyle are you are you sure like you know yeah. everything that's going on you've already been whinging around all oh, you clients have put everything on hold and you know blah 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 but I, I was just of the opinion that i needed to i needed to do it and i need to do it now because what i was really conscious of i didn't want to just pop up early next year when the bounce back was there and be like you know Hey everyone, I'm here to kind of you know sweep up all the fees. I, I thought mm. I really needed to put put this brand together so that by early next year we were kind of on the map and people had started to hear about us and and that type of stuff, you know. So and I was really conscious of that. So that four weeks was basically I was trying to get everything crammed in. So the website, the name, getting it registered, the bank account, like that 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 four weeks was pretty hectic. And I know we had a chat this morning, right, about about that around taking that period, like. Felt me, I, I wish. Like um, yeah. it was, it was madness, and obviously with two kids at home and all that. Yeah, type so what, of what was home, what was home life actually like? Like, is it is you was you is your wife's working? Is she homeschooling, or what was going on there? So the the kids are still like a uh, nursery age, so they go yeah. to they go to nursery two days a week, and um, the other three days um, they're at home with the wife because the wife only works two days a week, so she's mm-hmm. a teacher. Um, so yeah, it was. I mean, it was just. It was hectic when when they were at nursery. Those two days were bliss, and I mean it's the same now. You know, um, I sit in here, I've got the house to myself, I do what what I want, and I'm, I'm kind of cracking on. But when the kids are here, yeah, it's just like you know, the the three and a half and one and a half. So the the youngest definitely doesn't understand. So she's a proper daddy's girl. So you know, every five minutes, like daddy, opening the door, I'm trying on a Zoom call, trying to speak to a client, and I'm like, sorry about this, and the kids in, and then the dogs fucking barking and i'm like fuck me um it's so normal though the thing is it's yeah. normal everyone's dealing with it right yeah a final interruption to today's episode to introduce vincere vincere is the all-in-one crm ats platform built for the recruitment and staffing industry now i first heard about these guys about a year ago the amount of prospect recruitment agencies and clients i was working with that were telling me they were moving over to vincere i had to look into it 
And what I found was a business that had a global reach um, with multiple offices around the world. So they've got this follow the sun methodology, which allows them to support recruitment businesses wherever you are and, have, and, and be in your time zone. But the technology that they've invested in um, is becoming a, a disruptor in the space. More and more recruitment businesses are, are doing this to give their, their recruiters a competitive advantage. They broke into the G2 Crowd's momentum grid as a market leader based on their reviews from their customers. So the, the agencies that are using this platform are raving about it. Now, if you're a rag listener and you're thinking about changing CRM or you're a new business looking to launch with a new CRM, then I would get in touch with, the, with these guys because if you mention that you're a rag listener, they're doing an amazing deal. By visiting www.vincere.io forward slash rag, you can get an exclusive deal which offers two months completely free on a two-year commitment or three months completely free on a three-year commitment. This applies to all licenses that you've either signed up for now or that you'll add in the duration of the contract. So get on there and have a look. Finally, if you're listening to your recruiter and you're thinking, I want to move into a more of a business development role um, and I'd like to keep hold of my recruitment knowledge. Well, these guys are recruiting for a BD person, well, multiple roles in both Sydney and London right now. So if you've got a strong recruitment background, you want to move into BD and you want to work for a fast moving tech business that's helping people like you right now, then get in touch via their website because they're hiring today. Back to the show. Obviously, that time was was really stressful um, in terms of getting it all set up. But um, I was I was adamant that I wanted to kind of be ready to go when my notice period ended because I was yeah. just thinking, you know, any time that starts, you're starting to eat in towards the end of the year, which effectively eats into the time I've got to build the brand for yeah. 2021. It was was my kind of thought process. So you, what you've just said there says everything about you, in my opinion. Like build the brand. Like most people say, got to go and make money, got to go and bang the fees in. Like, I think you mean that, but you use a different terminology. You know what I mean? Like you, you're you not saying I build a brand at, at, at the mercy of not making any cash. You you see them as one thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. And that that's what I see as the difference. So many people say to me, Sean, love your shit, love marketing. I know I want to do it, but I need to make some money first. And <laughs> I, I just see it as like, it's the same fucking thing. Glenn mm. Saldam has just commented on, uh, on on LinkedIn Live saying, feel your pain, Kyle. Try to cram as much into Mondays and Tuesdays as possible whilst they are at nursery. And I mean, Glenn, another marketer in our industry will completely agree that I've I seen in a WhatsApp group today, he said he's never seen more, more recruiters um, you know, actually understand that ROI is possible, that, that are believing in this stuff, that are buying this stuff. And um, so... Wait, before I get into it, what does where's ambition come from? I like, I like it, but I feel like I've heard it before. I feel like it's it feels familiar. But where where what, what's that's, that's, that's all the work that I'm doing on LinkedIn, mate. That's why. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so it, that's one of them where the amount of people that said to me because I was I, to be honest, I'm I'm the least creative person on planet Earth, honestly. And so I was getting the wife to help me like ideas, and I, I was really. I was really adamant that there was a few things that I wanted. So I wanted it to be kind of one word, really punchy that people would remember and ironically really easy to pronounce. And to me, like Orbition, you know, I look at it and it just reads Orbition, but it's funny because every, every person that reads it fucking pronounces it wrong. Um, oh, yeah. So, so, so I, fa I, failed, I failed at that, but, um, but it's one of them, like, you know, everyone was saying like, when you know, you'll know on the name, you'll stumble across something and that'll be it. Yeah. And that didn't happen for me. There was no kind of light bulb moment. So effectively, I, I had this kind of image of how I wanted the brand to look. And I was kind of going for this like spacey, sci-fi, you know, futuristic yeah. data analytic -y type of, of thing. Um, so then, you know, I was trying to think of all these words and I was, you know, looking at all these glossaries of <laughs> things and, and orbit. I, I couldn't get rid of orbit, but there's, yeah. there's a few different recruitment businesses called orbit. And yeah. you know, I think a car rental business in America called orbit or something like that. Um, and, and then there was, I, I was just like looking and I started putting words together. Um, and that's effectively it. And, you know, there's no, there's no great story to it. It was like orbition. Mean kind of, hmm? Does this orbition mean anything? No, so it's made up. Made um, up yeah, just like Hoxo, love it, love it. All right, so, so what was, what, <coughs> what was your plan? Like you talked about building this brand, but what do you mean? Like what, what was your plan? Because you only started it, what, just under three months ago? Um, yeah, start of start of September. Yeah, so you joined my academy within like the first four weeks. I remember. Mm -hmm. 
what what was the plan? One of them obviously was come and work with us, which is brilliant. I loved it. Um, but what else? What else have you been doing? So I think obviously the events and stuff had been a pretty, you know, staple to to kind of the success that I'd had and, and the Lawrence Harvey business had had. So I was keen to to kind of make sure that we continued to, to do that. Um Obviously, you know, I was tied up in a whole host of contractual restrictions around working with any of those businesses. Yeah. And again, you know, a lot of people said to me, well, Kyle, why, why are you bothering? Like, what, what's the point? You know, if you can't, if you can't place with any of them, then what, what are you doing it for? Cause you're just wasting your time and your money. And I was like, well, well, not really, because, you know, other people will see that stuff that I'm doing. Everyone in that group knows me really well. So they refer me to other people. Um, and those contractual restrictions end at some point. So, you know, if, if I just, if I just don't speak to him for the next 12 months and then go back to him, my handout, they're probably going to tell me where to, you know, where to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Speak. So I was kind of like, definitely still need to be doing all that stuff to kind of keep that space warm for me for, for when the time comes. Um, and also then I, I basically tried to replicate doing that in, in other parts of, of the country, um, where I didn't have any restrictions. Um, and out in the US uh, as well. And obviously, you know, I'd been doing the the podcast at Lawrence Harvey, um, which we had to stop. And so I started a new podcast um, yeah. and kind of went full, full kind of throttle at it w- with that. So I think, you know, I often, I ask, I get asked these questions a lot. And, and to me, I don't think there's, I don't think there's too much in it. You know, I was kind of like, if you get to speak to hiring managers about stuff that's non-recruitment related, eventually the conversation becomes about recruitment and you win business from it. And and for me, the formula is as simple as that. So I was kind of going to go into potential hiring managers about the podcast and I wasn't doing it just, you know, trying to speak to them about recruitment. Um, you know, I was genuinely interested in having them on as a guest of the podcast because I think that's, my where, brand. that's, that's sorry to interrupt you there. That is exactly what I'm trying to tell people, right? Is whilst business development is an amazing byproduct of a bod- of a podcast or of mm-hmm. any content event series. If the single purpose you're doing it for is that, you will probably fail because you there's no sense you're not sincere, you're not interested. Like I absolutely love this podcast because I love hearing stories like the shit you've told me so far. Like I love it. Whether mm-hmm. we work together or not, I don't care. Like it will work with people, it won't work with people. But I genuinely love hearing stories that relate back to my life and I compare and I think shit, I did that or I didn't do that. Like it it genuinely worked for me and it sounds like you've you've worked out that that's the formula for you it's pick people that i want to know pick talk about things that i'm interested in or th- i know they're interested in and you know it's going to benefit you isn't it if you're in these rooms listening to these really in-depth data conversations you you're not a data architect but i bet you can talk at a level now that some of your competition can't yeah absolutely i mean i i think so mate i've um you know, I think I've tried to put myself, I've just tried to immerse myself in that as much as possible because yeah. I think there's there's so much there's so much in it to be able to, you know, go and have, you, you almost become, and I used to say this to, to the guys at Lawrence Harvey when I was like starting to build that, that kind of team and it's really cheesy, but I always used to say like, be a celebrity in your market. You know, no, I'm not talking about like David Beckham, flash cars, all that type of stuff. I'm talking about so that, everyone that you need to know your name knows your name for for a good reason you know not because you're a, a recruiter flinging shit around the market um and trying to you know upset people and all that type of stuff uh, so i think that that's the thing they, they, they go and they go in hand in hand you know and i think um as i say a lot of people a very much, you know, right, I'll do my day job, which is recruitment, you know, bashing the phones, calling people and, and absolutely on, on the same page as you, mate, like that stuff still works. And, you know, I, I still pick up the phone now when I need to, um, mm-hmm. to make a cold call and stuff like that. Um, but th- there's, there's a way to, in my opinion, th- there's a way to do it. And I think as time goes on, we're kind of transcending into that space, but obviously putting yourself to have conversations with some of the, you know, the biggest profile people in the industry, you know, and you talk about content and you, you just, you know, and, and I think that's where I'm, I'm often speaking about like on LinkedIn and the content that I use is I feel like I'm in a bit of a privileged position really. And I think a lot of recruiters put their clients on a pedestal, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, they're almost a bit, a bit scared to upset them and stuff like that. And, and actually, you know, most recruiters have such a unique view of the market because they see so many businesses. They're speaking mm-hmm. to, they're hearing challenges from from different people. And I think what you what you find is that 
most of the challenges across every business, especially within the market that you're operating in, are pretty much the same. Like the okay. challenges are the same. They're just on a different size and scale and in a different yeah. sector. You know, it has has different nuances to it, but ultimately the challenge is the same. So then, you know, you can start to position yourself as that person that can be, you know, trying to piece it all together for them and, you know, go, to, you know, people phone me and ask me for advice on stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> like what the fuck are you asking me for? Like, I, I don't know. You know, I know we spoke about this. I had someone yeah. ask me if they can send me a book and I'll leave them a review on it. And I was, <laughs> I was like, well, that's not going to help you, but um, <laughs> you know, whatever. It's, um, it. <laughs> yeah. It's great. I think, it's it's literally like I said this when I, I interviewed a girl Alex Kirika from um, This Is Tale um, uh, when I was in Ibiza in the summer, and I feel like for me personally, it's like the vision of what I what I saw happening is happening. Like you know, I I thought about my own restrictive covenant period exactly the same as you're going through in 2017, and thinking nothing in my contract says I can't be on video talking and they can't watch me. I can't ring them but they can watch me and they could watch me every fucking day if I want. And this was, you couldn't even post video on LinkedIn. It was only YouTube. Mm -hmm. So you go on LinkedIn now, Kyle, and how many you scroll and you see video constantly, right? So now you've got to be a bit different. Now it's about raising the game. Now it's about having super value, super niche. Um, but back then there was none of that. And now I'm just like, if you're fundamentally not catching on to this, yeah, I, I, I mean, in fact, I think it's a good thing because it just means it's not overly saturated for those like you that, that are, you know, because it will get to a point in the next couple of years where it's like everyone's doing it and then we'll have to raise mm -hmm. the bar again. Yeah. Um, so what, what does 2021 look like for you? Like you're, you know, you're coming towards the end of your first four months or so. I believe you've had a, you know, you've had a strong four months. You talk every week, you're talking about wins and deals going in. So business is, is good. What, what does next mm -hmm. year look like? Um, so the, the plan for us is just to kind of grow and, and, and scale really. So, um, obviously, you know, I guess the whole host of things like flying around in my mind around how the best ways to, to do that. I think obviously we, we have a big presence in the UK naturally from, you know, I guess the, my footprint and, and reputation. Um, but the U S is big on the agenda. Um, we've done, you know, a bit, quite a bit of retained work out there already. Um, and obviously, you know, I think we all know the benefits of operating out there. Yeah, so yeah. longer term, I'm pretty sure there'll probably be a presence out in the, out in the U S. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, short to midterm 2021 looks like just bringing a, a few good people into the business that can kind of help with, mm -hmm. you know, help building the brand basically. Um, and I talk a lot about, you know, I talk a lot about that, but I think the 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 thing for me with with all of this, and especially when you're trying to bring in maybe more junior people, is just that whole thing of like belief and confidence, um, just to to do it. And I guess you know it, it's easy when you're a bit older, right, and you've kind of done it before to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, you know, bring bring good people in. Um, definitely, you know, be looking to. You know, I've toyed with the idea of um, I know you know probably everyone listening will know Joe Mullins. Um, mm -hmm. That that'd be quality, you know. If I get someone to follow me around with a camera and stuff like that, um, you know, that that that'd be the the epitome. He but a, uh, he took it to a new level, that guy. Yeah, he has. He has. Yeah. So, um, but no, I think we're we're gonna we're gonna grow and scale, mate. Start to give it a bit of structure. Obviously, at the minute, you know, it's just me, and I've got a few people that work with me on a kind of associate basis, as I need some kind of resource and support. Um, but we'll kind of look to give it a bit of structure. You know, specific geographies. Um, you know, probably incubate the US from from here for a while until it's time maybe to go and have a have a official presence out there and start to you know divvy up the market so it's something a bit specific because I guess I'm trying to you know sweep across the whole thing and you know as as uh, as good as I like to think I am I'm, I'm not good enough to to kind of take market share on my own really so I like it I love you you're so honest you're so humble um. I think you're genuinely more different than you think, than you realize. Like I talk to people all day that in your role and, and, you know, I, from the minute I met you, I was, I was impressed with the the mindset. Um, what, what, what drives you Kyle? Like forget work. Why, why are you doing this shit? Like why, why do you get up every morning and, and, you know, put your headset on, block the kids out and go and do it. What, why, why? Um, I mean, I think it, there's obviously definitely a financial element to it for me, you know, longer term, I'd love to, 
I'd love to be in a position where I, I don't have to work every day um, and, and spend time with, with, with the kid, you know, spend more time with the kids and the wife and be able to travel kind of when you want and stuff like that. But um, so, you know, the, the, the family's the, the number one driving force with, with, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, but, you know, beyond that, I think I've, I've probably found the thing that I'm passionate about. And to go back to what we spoke about earlier, you know, you could pick me up and you could put me, I don't know, put me in Papua New Guinea if you wanted and give me a phone and a headset and, and ask me to, you know, ask me to make money in the chemical industry. And I probably could, right? So, you know, I don't know how good I'd be at it, but I could probably make, make someone some money. But I think I finally found the thing that I'm passionate about. So, you know, I guess contradictory to what I said earlier around, you know, anyone, any recruiter, if they're good at what they do, can make money. And I, I still believe that. But I think if you find the thing that you're passionate about, it's – you know, it makes it easier to do all of this stuff that a lot of people look at and think that's a lot of hard work and they kind of view it as something separate, you know, and the whole thing with the podcast and all that type of stuff, you know, my language is just constantly banging on about giving back to that mm. community. And I think it's probably been that mindset that's um, allowed me to kind of get dragged into a lot of conversations and, you know, get a lot of followers on LinkedIn that are constantly on, you know, feeding off the off the content and that generates conversations and so on and so forth. So, you know, driving force is definitely the family to have a better life longer term. But, um, you know, as, as my track record has probably proven in terms of the number of times I've started something, uh, I do have a, well, uh, an inclination you. towards trying to get something and build it from scratch. And I think, you know, if you get to a point in three, five, <clears throat> ten years time where ambition is up there, um, you know, as one of the, if not the biggest known, you know, data analytics recruitment business in the world, then, you know, I'd be, I'd be very happy. Because I think that's, that's one of the things for me and one of my, one of the things I constantly bang on around in terms of recruitment, I think too many businesses try to be too many things to too many people. Oh, yeah. I mean, I looked around that landscape. There's only really one major name that has dominated the space that I'm in on a global basis. Um, so I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, oh, you. we can definitely take, we can definitely take some of that off them. Um, you know, mm. cause everyone else does it, but they also do a lot of other things. Yeah. yeah, well. yeah. And, that, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. Like the amount of times I've been asked, well, you do some work with, um, I don't know, a property company or there's loads of different industries that need inbound and personal yeah. brand. And, but for me, no, nah, like I, I stick to what I, I want to do and I, what I, mm -hmm. I'm focused on as industry. And, and I, <laughs> I, I, even when you're looking at marketing for recruitment, if you, if you look at a business with so many disciplines, they, what they don't realize is every single one is a mini business. So you, mm -hmm. If you've got 10 divisions that do completely different markets in different in different locations, you kind of need 10 brands with 10 recruit marketing strategies, with 10 mm -hmm. phases of it. And yeah. you know, you're duplicating effort everywhere. Whereas if you can go, we're gonna nail this one area globally. Um, like one of our clients, a company called Focus Cloud in the workday space, they do that HRIS and mm -hmm. financial software. Unbelievable business. Because they know yeah. what they they know exactly who they are. Like they just dominate globally yeah. in that space. And I can see you. I can see you doing the same thing. What a little bit of value for the for the audience. What um, obviously apart <laughs> apart from the the rag, of course. What uh, what else do you consume? Like what 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 you reading? What you listening to? What what? How are you getting ideas and stuff outside of your your work in the market? Um, so I'm a I'm a bit of a well a podcast listener, um, which mm -hmm. is ironic. I, ne I never used to listen to podcasts until I started doing them, and I thought I probably should listen to some people that are actually <laughs> good at this. Um, <laughs> so I can pick up a few tips, but um, so I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of stuff that's more around just business in general. Um, yeah. You know, I think, and I think this is another thing with why a lot of recruitment companies don't do a lot of the the content and branding stuff is because they're all they're they're always worried about what they should or shouldn't be posting, you know, like where do I get the content from? And and most of the, I'd say 90% of the content comes from conversations that I have with yeah. people in the market. So, you know, for me, obviously recruitment is the, is the kind of the business that I'm in, but you know, I, I like, I like the, the, the business scene. So, um, you know, like the high performance podcast, I listen to that, yeah, yeah. Listen to that you know, um, how I, the, how I built this, um, yeah listen to some a pretty cool one with the founder of Airbnb um, yeah, and about yeah. I know how he failed how many times so um, yeah a, a lot of stuff like that read read you know some business books some sports books um, stuff on like 
teamwork I'm quite quite big on. So there's a, a Clive Woodward book called Winning. I don't know if you've read that. That's no, a, no, it's, a, it's a good read. It's about the the uh, England rugby uh, rugby World Cup winning team. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just just stuff like that really. Um, I'd love to read more, but you know, two kids running around um, don't know. get don't yeah, it's finding the time sometimes. But yeah. I get it. I get it. I, I, as much as I hate United, I love the Alex Ferguson book on leadership. I, yeah. uh, I thought his book on his book on leadership was incredible. I thought it just really the way he protected the players for so long, the way he kept the team fresh, the way he he put the the logo above everything else. I thought was just yeah. something that you know, if anyone's not listened or read or listened to the Alex Ferguson book on leadership, I mean, wow. Um, but Kyle. Um, I want to say thanks. I've loved getting to know you anyway. I know I'm, I'm well excited to see what happens to you next year. I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be rooting for you. If anyone who's listening does want to reach out and to pick your brains um, within reason, <laughs> you, you're open to a chat and, and helping other people out, yeah? Yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, All just right. uh, LinkedIn's the best way, mate. That's it. So um, you'll be tagged in everything here. Um, thank you again for, for giving us your time, mate. I really appreciate it. And, um, and guys, we... Um, we, we you know we're entering it's the first of December today. This will be I think this is live on the second of December, so it goes out on on the YouTube on the podcast and YouTube the following day. Um, I hope you I hope you're feeling all right globally. Obviously, you know we're all in different positions in the UK. We're well, depending on where you live, you you might, you might find the world changes. Me and me and Kyle are just thinking I can get my hair cut. That's about it. Um, <laughs> the gym's open, but I don't know if I'm going to get there. Um, but the you know we, we we're in for an interesting four weeks. Um, I'm trying to do my I'm trying to do my best like to give back. So um, you know, this podcast is coming twice a week till Christmas with with consistent stories from people in the UK and Australia on how we can tackle this pandemic. Um this Thursday, eight o'clock on LinkedIn Live, I'll be joined with Pete Watson, my co-host, and Anton Rowe, who is the uh, managing director of a, a company called Marshall McAdam in, in in Melbourne, I believe. Yeah, he's in Melbourne, not Sydney. Another academy graduate of ours and um Lovely, lovely guy, English guy who lives out there. I want to understand his his lockdown journey, which has been incredible. Um, and then we've got some some more wicked guests for you next week. So all I ask for you guys to do is if you're listening, if you're watching on LinkedIn Live, if you're listening on the podcast YouTube, please, please, please just share this with somebody else. Let them know, you know, if you, if you especially Kyle's story, if you've got friends, like you're 33 years old, brand new recruitment on, I think you are absolutely the 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 barometer for today's market like you you are absolutely the people you are the what people should be listening to people linking into right now because if you want to start a company or get your your startup off the ground you know the tips and the things you're doing it it's, it's, it's the current way to do it um so i'll be back again on thursday um in the meantime you stay safe and we'll see you very very soon